Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Point. How's everybody doing? We're going to do the wave in this church. I want you guys to start with the wave. Stand up and do that and then go follow, follow suit, follow suit. Yeah, good morning. That's how we do it at Cross Point. <laughs> hey, everybody online and everybody in the room want to invite you to worship with us. to be here. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Y'all looking good. He has done great Good morning, church. We want to say good morning to those of you that are here with us in person and those of you that are joining us online as well. We are so glad that you decided to worship with us here at Cross Point. 
this morning. And if you're new around here, we would love to have an opportunity to connect with you. If you just do me a favor, go to crosspointchurch.com slash next, follow the prompts. Or if you're here with us in person, just go out to a connection point in the lobby, let them know that you would love to get plugged in and hear your next step here at Cross Point. You see, here at Cross Point, we exist to point people to Jesus and inspire them to live the cross-shaped life. And we do that through four different ways. We do it through worship, through discipleship, through serving, and through sending. And guys, as we continue in our worship service, we pray that you would just keep that mission and that idea at the center and forefront of your mind. So if you do me a favor, just go ahead and stand up, say good morning to somebody around you as we continue in worship this morning. Well, let's continue to worship.
this far. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. can be seated. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 16, that God is a way maker. He makes a way when we can't see it. He, he parted the waters. He parted the sea. He gave a way for the people of Israel. He gave a way for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm excited that you're here today in worship. We welcome those of you who are with us online as well as we transition into our time of giving, our time of offering. You know, uh, speaking of giving, we had a fantastic week this past week with Kidapalooza and Kidapalooza Junior, our preschoolers and our kids. Just out of curiosity, if you helped in some way, form, or fashion with Kidapalooza, would you just stand for a minute and let us just thank you for all that you did to give to our kids all around the room? Amen. Well, thank you so much for giving of your time. I saw a lot of uh, dragging faces today. Uh, I tell you what, kids and preschoolers have lots of energy. And uh, if you don't believe that, just come serve with us on a Sunday. We'd love to have people who serve with us. Uh, I'm so grateful for Greg and for Jana as they led both of those ministry areas. And many of you gave uh, countless hours of time to serve. And th those of you who gave as well to make sure that that program uh, was there to help kids meet their needs, teach them a Bible, and also to bring people into a saving relationship with Christ. And what a blessing it is. This morning, we have a really treat. Our pastor is away as, as the convention starts this week. We, he mentioned that to you last week. And we have one of our pastors on our staff, uh, Austin Drummond, who's going to be preaching out of Colossians today. He's going to be uh, preaching on being a rescue. Amen. Uh, Austin came here uh, as a next-gen worker, uh, leader, assistant, associate, and then we ordained him uh, last year. God ordained him. We affirmed it. And, uh, and he's leading, currently leading our communications ministry now. So, Austin, we're grateful that you're here today, and we're praying for you as you, as you preach in a few moments. And as we give today, I want to remind you that we do have several different methods that you can give. There's a QR code on the back of the seat in front of you that you can use with your phone, capture that. You can also use one of the ways that we have on the bottom of the screen right now, uh, whether that's through the app, the website, or through text giving. And your faithfulness is what makes ministry happen at Crosspoint. So thank you for being faithful week in and week out. Let's pray right now. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for being a way maker. God, you make a way when there doesn't seem to be a way. And Father, we know this week as our kids were experiencing Kidapalooza and VBS, God, you made a way by providing all the volunteers that we needed. You made a way for those children who came to a relationship with Christ. You made a way in the Perry family this week as you took our brother Jim home to be with Jesus. And you made a way for Sharon and Allison and their family to continue to put the pieces back together and bring comfort and peace into their lives. God, you made a way through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who gave his life on the cross for us that we might know salvation. Thank you, God, for being a way maker. Thank you for being faithful in our lives. God, today, as we give our offering, your offering, and our tithe, I should say that the other way around, your tithe and our offering, because the tithe is yours. It, it all belongs to you, God, and we are just uh, stewards of that portion that you ask for us to give back to you. Thank you for allowing us to have all of it and trusting us by faith to give that portion back to you. Use every gift today to bring honor and glory to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Church. My name is Austin, and I am privileged to stand back up here uh, with you again. I want to say thank you to Bruce for all the kind words. Uh, in honor of uh, Jim Perry, I would like to say uh, to Sharon, uh, when I preached the last time, he sat down there beside me, and when I finished, he slid me a mint, and I, I, I said, what's this for? Do I need this? And he said, from working with our pastor for so long, I can assure you, you need this. <laughs> Uh, but I am privileged to stand up here this morning. Um, I want to say thank you to our pastor for this opportunity to preach this morning. Um, I do not take it lightly, and I'm really, really excited for what the Lord has for us this morning. So let's begin with a quick word of prayer. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity, God. I can't wait uh, just to open your word, Lord, and just to talk about it, Lord. I don't want to stand in the way, God. I pray that you'll take me out of the limelight. I pray that you will be glorified in everything that comes out of my mouth, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You've seen it in movies, you've played it in games, and you've read about it in books. There's nothing that we as human beings like quite like a rescue mission. Whether if it's SEAL Team 6 gearing up to go save a prisoner of war, whether if it's uh, Mario and Luigi gearing up to go rescue Princess Peach, whether if it's Shrek and Donkey, Mike Daniels' favorite movie, gearing up to go save and rescue Fiona, we love a good rescue mission. And the higher the stakes and the more improbable that the rescue seems, the more that we are drawn in. So in light of that, I want to depict a scene for you, and we're going to continue as we go this morning to go back to this scene. So I want you to get this in your minds. And the person we're going to talk about, we're going to label as Person A, because I didn't have another way to label them. Uh, So Person A. Person A has broken the law. And because Person A has broken the law, he has been banished from his homeland. The king said, you're a lawbreaker, you can't stay here. So he's been banished from his homeland. Not only has he been banished, but he's been banished to an enemy land. And he's now become a slave in enemy land. And the enemy, because he has broken the law, has said, because you've broken the law, there is now a price that has to be paid for you to ever be set free. This is a price that person A could never pay for himself. And even if the price was somehow paid, even if the price was somehow paid, He could never return to his homeland because he's broken the law and the king would never have him back. See, in this scene, a rescue is desperately needed. Person A is a slave with a price on his head that he can't pay and that even the most generous of kings would probably be unwilling to pay. The stakes are high and the rescue seems improbable. If you're not already drawn in this morning, I'm going to raise the stakes a little bit higher. Everyone in this room and everyone watching online is person A. I just described the state that the Bible, not me, that the Bible describes you as being in. 
So in light of that, a rescue is needed. That's the bad news. The good news this morning is that the most probable and undeserving rescue that has ever been completed in human history has already been completed on your behalf. And that's the rescue that we are going to spend the rest of our time talking about this morning. So if you have a copy of God's word with you this morning, if you will open it to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one is in the New Testament. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I was taught in fifth grade to remember that as General Electric Power Company. I raised my hand and I said, why? What does that have to do with it? And the teacher told me to be quiet. But I have, <laughs> I have never forgotten that though. So General Electric Power Company, Colossians chapter one. This is Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And they had a lot of problems if you dig down into it, but their one main problem was that they refused to view Jesus as supreme. They respected who he was, they thought he was great, but they didn't view him as first in their lives. And so therefore, when they thought about the salvation that they had been given, they did not view Jesus as sufficient for that salvation. And so it's that context that Paul is writing this letter. So if you'll read with me, Colossians chapter one, verses 12 through 14, says this, giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So in verses 13 and 14 there, Paul lists four steps to God's rescue mission on our behalf this morning. But right before we get there, look back in verse 12. It says, giving thanks to the Father. So all the things we're gonna talk about today are reasons why you ought to give thanks to the Father. And before we even get to our points today, Paul is already setting the stage. He gives you two words. One is qualified. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified. You did not qualify yourself. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in an inheritance. What we know about an inheritance is that it is not earned, it's given to you. So Paul is already trying to set the picture that you've done none of this on your own. You are a slave in enemy territory and you are helpless. You did nothing to deserve a rescue and you have nothing to deserve a rescue. Nothing like a good encouragement this morning, right? You did nothing to deserve a rescue. You have nothing to deserve a rescue. And yet God has done it anyways. And it's this rescue that we're gonna talk about today, a rescue like no other. The first point of God's glorious rescue mission this morning is listed in verse 13. It says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Point number one, believers have been delivered. Delivered from the domain of darkness. Remember, you are or you were in the domain of darkness. And on top of that, if you'll read in verse 21 of Colossians chapter 1, it says that you were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. So, newsflash, on top of the fact that you are in this enemy territory, you deserve to be there. You're hostile in mind. You're doing evil deeds. So, you can't woe is me this thing. You deserve to be there. Remember, you've broken the law. And so we talk about the domain of darkness. That's where you are. First of all, we're gonna talk about that word domain. Uh, I'm gonna give you, a, I did graduate seminary. I made it through Greek. I can't just open it up and read it like our pastor can, but I kind of at least know what to look for. Uh, that word for domain is exousia. Everybody say exousia. Okay, good. I'm gonna have you do that a couple more times. I was hoping that somebody would say something. Uh, exousia, which means power or authority. So we're talking about the power of darkness or the authority of darkness. You are under that authority. See, while God is always in sovereign control at all times, when you are an unbeliever, you are still under Satan's authority. And then how do we know that it is Satan's authority? Well, it says the domain of darkness. All throughout scripture, there's this contrast between light and darkness, which contrasts God and Satan. Hell is referred to in Matthew 8 as outer darkness. Our fight with Satan is referred to as this present darkness. On the other hand, 1 John says that God is light and in, in him is no darkness at all. And then finally, in Acts chapter 26, the, God's desire is that people will turn from darkness to light and from the power of God to, from the power of Satan to the power of God. So there's this contrast, light versus darkness. You are in the domain of darkness. You are under Satan's authority. Now to the good part. God has delivered you. It says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. The Greek word there for delivered is ruamai. Everybody say ruamai. 
That's a hard one to say. Uh, Ruamai, which gives the idea of a rescue by a sovereign power. It's the same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament when it talks about God's delivering his people from Egypt. So in the book of Exodus, same word that's used here. This is not a rescue that you assisted in. This is not a rescue that you helped in. This is not uh, me falling in the pool and uh, Corey Benson coming and helping me up out of the pool. That is not what this is. This is a rescue by a sovereign power. It gives more of the idea of someone drowning under crashing waves and moments before they're swallowed followed up forever, a hand reaches down and pulls them out. That's the kind of deliverance that we are talking about. So this deliverance is powerful on your behalf, and it's also instantaneous. The Greek word for delivered is also in the past tense, which means if you've ever attended any grammar class, it's already been done. It's not in the process of being done. God is not in the process of delivering you. At the very moment that you place your faith in God, He delivers you right then, right there. So God has rescued you. God has delivered you. That is our first point this morning. But our magnificent God, and I really believe that, our magnificent God has not just stopped at delivering you. He's also done something else. Look with me in the end of verse 13. It says, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Point number two this morning, believers have been transferred. You've been transferred. The Greek word here for transferred is methystemi. Say that. Methystemi. That's a long one as well. What that means, though, is it describes a mighty king that picks up an entire population and deports it to another realm. Raise your hand if you've ever read uh, anything from the book of Daniel in here. Read the book of Daniel, read the fiery furnace. Somebody loves the book of Daniel. Uh, read about the fiery furnace, lions, and all this stuff. The reason that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are in this... Uh, city, country, uh, nation of Babylon is because Babylon invaded their country and the king deported them and transferred them to Babylon. So we kind of see that working out in scripture. They were transferred. And this is what God has done for you. This is not like Superman when the building is burning and he goes in and he saves someone and he sets them on the ground and he goes and gets somebody else. That's not what God is doing for you. God has transferred you. So God is not just saving you from something. He is also taking you to something. He's moving you, transferring you to his kingdom. A.W. Tozer wrote, God does not stop at rescuing us. The purpose of that rescue is to enjoy fellowship with us. See, God's whole point in this rescue process is so that he can have fellowship with you. Your next question is, why doesn't he already have fellowship with me? And the answer is two words, your sin. Your sin separates you from God. It creates this gap between you and God. And there is no way for that gap to be closed on your behalf. And so God's rescue mission is him seeking to close that gap. God wants to have fellowship with you. So then you ask, where does this fellowship take place? Where where can I show up for this? It says, to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's where you're transferred. Then you ask, who is this king's son? What are his credentials? What does Paul think about him? Paul says, I got you right here. Look with me in verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1, a very famous passage of scripture. This is talking about Jesus. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. That's a mouthful. That's a lot. That is quite a description. But Paul is trying to leave no doubt as to who Jesus is. Preeminent there means greatly distinguished or surpassing all others. Our our Savior, Jesus, surpasses all others. He is of utmost importance. I kind of made a joke about it at the beginning. But the description that I gave you where I called us all person A, the reason I did that is because I did not want to call us the main character. And the reason is because when you sit down in the morning or you sit down at night and you open up this book and I sit down and I open up this book and I start to read it, I am hit in the face. I'm struck with the fact over and over and over again that I am not the main character of this story, right? Jesus is the main character of this story and it is into his kingdom that you've been transferred. 
Ephesians 2 says you become no longer a foreigner or a stranger. You become a citizen. So now if you think in your mind back to our uh, depiction at the beginning, you've now been delivered from the domain of darkness. You've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. You stand in the kingdom of his beloved son, but something still feels off. You don't quite feel like you belong there yet. And the reason is this. Remember, the enemy has said there is a price on your head. You've broken the law. Therefore, somebody has got to pay this price for you. And it is not a price that you could ever pay for yourself. The good news this morning, church, is that this price has already been paid. Verse 14, if you look at the very beginning, it says, in whom we have redemption. Point number three, believers have been redeemed. Believers have been redeemed. At the beginning of that verse, it says, in whom? Who is the in whom referring to? Jesus. There we go. I think I heard somebody say it. Uh, The in whom is referring to Jesus. Remember, it said the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom? So this is referring to Jesus. See, we have redemption. We've been redeemed because of Jesus's work. God prays, or Paul praises God for his plan of redemption. And he also here praises Jesus for being our redeemer. The Greek word for redemption is apolutrosis. Everybody say apolutrosis. I actually hyphenated that one in my notes to make sure I pronounced that right. Apolutrosis, it means to deliver by payment of a ransom. This was a word used in Bible times when a slave was paid for and then set free. The word in English means to buy back through a payment. See, remember, you were a slave in enemy territory. There was a price on your head because of the laws that you broke. And this is a weird thing. If you read through kind of the whole Bible, you read through Genesis 1, you realize God created us. And therefore, if you create something, it is your possession. So we are God's possession. So why is it that he has to buy us back? Why is it that he has to redeem us? And it's the same answer we had a few minutes ago, your sin. Your sin separates you from God and your sin is costly. It places a price on your head that you can never pay for yourself. And I think this idea of redemption is no more beautifully portrayed than in the story of Hosea. Has anybody ever read the book of Hosea in the Bible? Okay, a couple of people. I'm going to tell you real quick. I'm going to take about one minute to tell you about Hosea. Hosea was a prophet of God. Prophet, speak for God. So he goes to God. He says, God, what do you have for me to say? God says, actually, Hosea, I have something for you to go and do. And it's a shocking kind of twist. And he says, Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. And we see later that Hosea obeys. Hosea goes and finds a woman, a beautiful woman named Gomer, and he marries her. And by all accounts, it seems like a very good marriage. They have three children. They're married. They've become one. There's mutual trust. Uh, They're married. So he is hers. She is his. Everything seems to be going well until it says that Hosea goes back to her former life. She leaves, or sorry, Gomer goes back to her former life. She leaves Hosea. And she becomes enslaved again. So Hosea goes to God and he says, God, what do I do? I obeyed what you told me to do and now she's left me. What do I do? And God says in Hosea chapter 3, he says, go again, Hosea. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Is an adulteress. Imagine this scene. Hosea obeys. Hosea goes to find Gomer. We know from other details in the story that more than likely he finds her at a slave auction. So if you can imagine, Hosea walks up to the auctioneer and he says, excuse me, sir, that woman up there, third from the left, her name is Gomer. She's my wife. I've come to take her home. And the auctioneer, you can imagine, says something to the effect of she has a price and it's got to be paid. And so the next verse in scripture says, so Hosea paid. Hosea pays the price for his wife, Gomer. He pays for what was already his. This is why I don't want you to miss this morning. This is the reason I told you that. God has done the exact same thing with you. God has done the exact same thing with you. Jesus seeks you. Jesus finds you. He enters the domain of darkness. He sees you. He says, my prized possession, my creation, my image, I've come to take you home. And Satan says, no, no, they, he, she has broken the law. And therefore there's a price that must be paid. And so Jesus, our savior, paid that price. 
He paid for what was already his. That's what 1 Corinthians means when it says that you have been bought with a price. God, through his son, has bought you back from a life of sin. The difference here, though, is that Hosea paid money for Gomer. It says he paid 15 shekels of silver. But Jesus did not pay money for you. Jesus paid with his blood. Ephesians chapter 1 says that in Jesus we have redemption through his blood. This rescue that we're talking about this morning is not possible, nor is it complete without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. One more way to illustrate this real quickly is uh, there was a newspaper clipping of a little boy in Mississippi. He lived right along the Mississippi River, and he loved to build these boats. And he would build them and set them uh, on the Mississippi River, and he would follow it, love to watch it uh, take with the current, and he'd pick it up and take it home. One day he makes one, and he was very proud of it. And he sets on the Mississippi River on a windy day, and the current takes it away. And he's, you know, getting his little legs running. He's trying to catch up with it, and he can't. He can't catch it, so the boat is lost. A couple months later, he's walking with his dad through town, and they see in a pawn shop window the boat. And so he gets his dad to go in there with him. He walks up to the man at the counter. He says, sir, that's my boat. I've come to take it home. And the man at the counter says, I'm so sorry, son, but this is the price of that boat. So the boy and his dad paid for the boat. And as the boy is walking out of the store, he is holding the boat like his most prized possession in the entire earth. And he says, I've made you once, and now I've bought you once. And if you can imagine Jesus standing there after he's delivered you and transferred you and redeemed you, he stands and he looks at you and he says, I have made you once and I've bought you once. That is redemption. That is what Jesus has done for us. But now back to our depiction from the beginning. You've now been delivered. You've now been transferred and you've been redeemed. But there's one thing that still feels missing. Something feels off and you realize it's the fact that you feel guilty. You don't understand why you feel guilty. Let me, let me describe it for you. Imagine that you are a teenager. We've got our teenagers sitting down here. Imagine you're a teenager and you have to spend the night in jail because you stole a candy bar from a store. Okay? The next morning you wake up, your parents are there, they post bail for you, uh, it is paid for, you get in the car and you go home with them. Uh, according to how we would think, everything should be good, right? You've been delivered from jail, you're being transferred back to your house, probably your room, and the, you have been redeemed, you've been bought back, right? But if you think through it, parents in the room, that car ride home is not fun, right? Because the teenager has still broken the law. He or she feels guilty. The parents are still upset about it. And it's the same with you. God hates sin. People don't like to hear that, but God hates sin. He does not hate you as a sinner, but he hates sin. It is his opposite. He can't stand to look at it. So the question is, how can he fellowship with me, a sinner? And the answer is found in our fourth point, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Point number four this morning, believers have been forgiven. When we talk about forgiven, you are being granted a pardon from your punishment. A pardon basically means you don't have to pay the price anymore. You're done. You're you're free from that. Now, a lot of people miss this, and I think this is very important. You don't have to understand this, but if you do, I think that your idea of God and your idea of what Jesus has done for you will be raised a little bit more. A lot of people think that when God, when it says that we have been forgiven, that we've been given a pardon, that God just chose not to punish our sin. And that's not the case. See, God has to punish sin. It would be opposite of his nature not to punish your sin and my sin. See, the reason that the sin in your life is such a big deal is not because the pastor hates it. It's not because the church hates it. The reason that the sin in your life is such a big deal is because God has to punish it. He has to punish it. So for believers who are sitting here in this room, you know you've been forgiven, then your question is, what happened to the punishment for my sin? Who took the punishment for my sin? Where did God put all of his wrath for my sin? And the answer is Jesus. He placed it all on Jesus. Isaiah 53 says, He, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity 
of us all. He placed it all on Jesus. See, God poured all of his wrath and all of his punishment for your sin on his son, Jesus. And why was Jesus willing to do this? Because in Hebrews chapter 9, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So Jesus has done this for you. You see it in the familiar song, uh, In Christ Alone. It's one of my favorite songs. And it says, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That is where our forgiveness comes from. God's wrath is satisfied because of Jesus' sacrifice, and therefore he is able to look at you and say, I forgive you. Our last Greek word for today is the Greek word for, give, for forgiveness. It is aphesis. Say aphesis. Save the easiest one for last. Ephesus is actually a compound word. We're doing some grammar here today too, folks. It's actually a compound word, which you know is a word that is made up of two words. It's made up from the Greek word apo, which means from or away, and the Greek word hemi, which means to send. If you put those two together, you get to send away. See, God has not just overlooked your sins. He has literally sent them away. And Psalm 103 says that he has sent them as far as the east is from the west. On the day of atonement in the Old Testament, the day where they paid for sins, the high priest would go before God and pay for the sins of the people. He would take two goats. And the one that a lot of people know about is the one goat they would kill as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice, right? The other goat, though, uh, as some of you may know, was called the scapegoat. And what they would do is he would take that goat and the high priest would place his hands on that goat's head and he would confess all the sins of the people. And then there was one man in charge of taking that goat out into the wilderness and setting it free and leaving it out there. And what that was, what God was doing was he was giving a literal picture of sending your sins away. So not only has Jesus sent your sins away and your forgiveness, this forgiveness also finalizes your rescue. So not only has God rescued you and set you free and purchased you back and transferred you into his kingdom, but God has also canceled every debt that you owe so that you can never be enslaved again. See, your sin debt has been canceled. You don't have to pay it anymore. Satan can no longer find any reason to indict you because there's no evidence left of your sin. God has sent it all away. Lastly, this forgiveness comes with open arms. When God looks at you and says, I forgive you, please come home. It's not with the back of his mind saying, I can't believe they did so-and-so yesterday or I can't believe they do so-and-so tomorrow. No, God has chosen to not remember your Sins. And because of that, God can welcome you home to his kingdom as if you never left, as if you never broke a law. After the Civil War, when the Confederate army was defeated and those soldiers were going back to their homes, people were asking Abraham Lincoln, who was the president, he's on the penny, they were asking him, hey, how are you going to treat these soldiers? A lot of people thought they were, he was going to take vengeance on these soldiers, but Abraham Lincoln said this, to the shock of many people, Lincoln said, I will treat them as if they had never been away. And God has done the same thing for you in his forgiveness to you. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, God is able now to treat you as if you had never been away. So to close everything up this morning, go back to our depiction from the beginning. Any king would be just to uphold the laws of his land. Any king would be just to punish someone who broke one of those laws. Any king would be just to banish a lawbreaker from his land. The king is just in doing that. Any king would be just to leave that lawbreaker for all of eternity in the enemy's land. And any king would be just to leave that lawbreaker in his helplessness. The good news this morning, church, is that our God is no ordinary king. And instead of leaving you a lawbreaker in your helpless state, God chose to rescue you. He delivered you from the domain of darkness. He transfers you into his kingdom. He redeemed you and he forgave you, sending your sins away forever. You didn't deserve it. 
The stakes were really high and the rescue seemed improbable. This was a rescue like no other. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? As we close up, I wanna talk to two groups of people really quick. The two groups of people, really you can boil everyone on earth down into two groups of people. Number one is people who have experienced this rescue that we talked about this morning. And number two would be the group of people who have never experienced this rescue. First, the people that have. We call these people Christians. We call these people believers. You're sitting here today and you understand everything that we've talked about because you've tasted it, you've seen it, you've felt it, you've experienced it. You know what it's like. You, you are still a sinner, but you know what it's like to see forgiveness for your sins. You know what it's like to have fellowship with God. So believers, if you have experienced this rescue, your task this week is to go and tell somebody about it. If someone tonight rescued you from a burning building, everyone in your life would know about it in the morning. How much more should the people in your life hear about the rescue that brought you from death to life? The other group of people in here and the other group of people that are watching online are people who are unbelievers. You've never heard this message before. Maybe you've heard it and you've never accepted it, but you don't quite understand what it feels like to be rescued, to be delivered. You don't know what it's like to have fellowship with God. You don't know what it's like to have forgiveness from your sins. You would love it, you feel guilty, but you've never experienced that before. I'm gonna take about 30 seconds to tell you how you can. See, God created you, God loves you, and God wants to have fellowship with you every single day. But the problem that we talked about all morning, your sin separates you from God because God is holy, he has to send you away. This creates this wide gap between you and God. You're over here and God is over here. And on top of that, you, the Bible says, are spiritually dead. And there's nothing that a dead man can do to save himself. There's nothing, you're dead. So on top of the fact that you are separated from God, you have no way of closing that gap. So if you and God are ever to be reconciled to each other, the initiative must come from God. And the wonderful news of the gospel is that God has already taken that initiative. God sent his one and only son to be a sacrifice, to shed his blood and to die in order to pay off your sin debt. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, God is able to deliver you from the domain of darkness. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, he's able to transfer you into his kingdom. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, he is able to redeem you and to buy you back from a life of sin. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, God is able and willing to forgive you. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, God can and will rescue you. There is nothing that he would like to do more. All you have to do is ask. So with the heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I'm gonna walk you through how to ask God to rescue you. There's no magic words, but when we do this, we do it in a form of prayer. So pray something like this. God, thank you for what you've done for me. I've heard this morning about what you've done for me. God, I know that I was helpless in my sin. I know I've broken your law and I know that I am in desperate need of a savior. And God, I recognize and I am thankful that you have already sent that savior. Everything has already been done. God, all I have to do is accept it. And God, right now in this moment, I want to accept it. I place all of my faith in the fact that what Jesus did on the cross is enough for me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed something like that this morning, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, we want to know about it. So if you are here in this room, right when we finish uh, singing, I want you to walk outside the table right straight through there. Uh, we always say a table, it's actually three tables. There's three tables out there that we call connection point. And there's people out there that are ready and equipped to help you take the next step in your faith. So whether you accepted Jesus as your savior this morning, whether you, you realize that you need to be baptized in order to obey the Lord, whether you want to become a part of this church, whether you want to start a small group, we want to help you take the next step. 
For those watching online, you can do that by going to crosspointchurch.com slash next. And there are people there who also will help you take the next step in your faith journey. So God has rescued you. This was a rescue like no other. He has delivered you from where you were. He has transferred you to his kingdom. He's bought you back from your life of sin and he has forgiven you. God looks at you right now and does not see your sin if you're a believer. God does not see your sin. God sees his son. So be thankful this week for this rescue. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this rescue. God, I just over the moon these past couple weeks preparing this message at what you've done for me. God, you've delivered me. I was completely helpless. I was sinful. There's nothing I could do to save myself. And God, graciously, although you had to do absolutely nothing, you chose to do something about it. God, you've delivered me. You've transferred me. You've redeemed me. You've forgiven me. Lord, you've done the same thing for all the people in this room, Lord. We want to say simply thank you for what you've done. God, I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
what an amazing day in the house of the Lord. Once again, want to thank Austin for his faithfulness and his preparation this morning as he taught from God's Word. Guys, we are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. On your way out, we will have application questions for you to apply the message uh, this week. But Crosspoint Church, you are sent.